Yes. That was two very interesting talks, doing very clever things. I'm going to do something very, um, very unclever, but hopefully it's of interest. So I'm going to talk about rider blocks and the mechanics of low angle normal faulting. And the question is, why on some flexing normal faults do we see rafted blocks and on others we don't? And this is based on a paper I published in Tectonic Physics 2020. And I noticed that one of the reviewers is in the audience. So thank you, Jean Arthur, for an excellent review. Very helpful. Can I interrupt you briefly? Can you, it would be nice if you turn on your camera, then we can see you. Oh, yeah. If you, if you really want to see me. Oh, dear. OK. Oh, there you go. Hello. So, um, right. So this is, a, this is the section through the Whipple detachments, one of the most famous uh, low angle normal faults uh, there is. And you can see that above the detachment fault, we have these rider blocks, which are, have, have probably been rafted up and out with the footwall rather than sliding down it. I think we need to think of these things as rafted blocks rather than rider blocks in many cases, although perhaps not always. And at the bottom, we see the S detachment, which is uh, at the rift, Iberia rifted margin, west of Spain, where we can see a fault which is currently low angle, which is a series of fault blocks on top of it, which may well have been rafted up with it. And we can look at the angle of slip of the S detachment by looking at the relationships between the center of sediments and the and, and S and work out that S must have slipped at about 22 degrees, so a genuine low angle normal fault. Oops, I need to, there we go. And we've heard quite often already today that there's this common view that low angle slip at less than 30 degrees is paradoxical, requiring stress rotation, high fluid pressures or something else. But I'm going to argue that shallow low angle slip is completely compatible with completely standard fault mechanics and how the presence or absence of rider blocks reveals the mechanics of low angle slip. So this is just a standard Moore circle with a some sort of shear fracture criterion shown through here. This is the Moore circle is shown the, the, or the, the distribution of shear and normal stress as a function of the orientation of the fault relative to sigma three. And when we have uh, a new fault is generally initiates here, which is an angle of about 60 to 65 so relative to 60 th sigma three, which in an extension means we get a normal fault dipping at 60 to 65 degrees, all standard Andersonian mechanics. If we have a, an existing fault, we can draw, draw again from sigma three to this point over here to get the minimum possible slip on that fault uh, when the stress state is just insufficient to initiate a new fault. And this is all old hat, we get a a fault active to maybe as low as 30 degrees. So how do we explain slip at, 30 at less than 30 degrees, degrees? And how do we explain rafted blocks? So I'm going to start off by looking at the rafted block problem first of all. And let's consider a fault, normal fault, which is flexing as it's unroofed. And as it's unroofed, it's going to take up a geometry like this, which when we look in dip depth space, looks something like this. And we can see that if the fault always locks up at 30 degrees, very soon that's going to intersect the lock-up points and the fault's going to lock, but it's going to lock at the surface. And if it locks at the surface, we're not going to form a rider block, we're going to form rubble. We're going to transfer tiny, tiny bits of the hanging wall to the foot wall, and our faults are just simply going to be covered with rubble rather than with rider blocks. But of we can get around that if we consider what happens as you get closer and closer to the surface. Is this 30 degree number always there? And the answer is no. So as you go closer to the surface, sigma one is going to become less and less. That's, the, that, that's equivalent to the overburden pressure. And to get uh, close to the initiation of a new fault, we may have sigma three becoming negative. And in that case, we start to find that this angle can become less than 30 degrees, in this case, 24 degrees. So as you get close to the surface, we expect to get slip on low angle faults. If we zoom in and look at that effect more closely, if we get to more extreme cases where we're now getting very close to the surface, sigma three is very negative and we get to get a very low angle fault. Now this is the approach that was done by Choi and Buck. Uh, I, I know there are problems with this, which I'm going to deal with in a second. But the point is that this predicts that we're going to get slip to angles as low as 10 degrees or for low cohesion faults, extremely low angles indeed. And based on Choi and Buck's uh, calculations from their 2012 paper, I produced this plot of depth versus the lockup angle for a variety of friction coefficients of the fault, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. Uh, the uh, unfaulted uh, friction coefficient was 0.8. And for a variety of, of in, in, intact cohesions and fault cohesion versus intact co cohesion ratios. 
So very much fairly strong faults here. And we can see that under more, more Coulomb conditions, we can get slip at very low angles, with the angle being determined fundamentally by the, the Coulomb ratio, the, 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 the cohesion ratio. Now, one implication of this is as you go from a fault initiating at maybe 65 degrees, and it, as it rotates, or a bunch of faults initiated at 65 degrees, depending on their properties, they may start to lock up at anywhere between about 50 degrees and about 25 degrees, depending on depth and the fault properties. And that means we're going to get a progressive lockup of faults, get fewer and fewer faults once we get past this point. And combining that with a fault rotation model means we can actually predict the depth distribution of earthquakes, which has already been alluded to by previous talk speakers, very simply by a combination of progressive fault lockup and, and fault rotation to give us the 45 degree peak and very few steep and very few low angle normal faults. Plotted on this, we can see the woodlark earthquake is completely compatible with low angle slip on faults because of this upward shallowing of the lockup angle. And also on there are the current uh, earthquakes. And I've just said, I was already had the Malu uh, fault plotted on there as well from Papua New Guinea, which sort of follows the low end of this, this, these curves, but is still compatible with fairly strong faults. So first sort of result from this is that reactivation of faults with standard friction coefficients and modern weakening explains the dip distribution of earthquakes, including woodlark. And it suggests that low angle normal faults are not paradoxical. But the second problem arises, and Choi and Buck also pointed, also spotted this problem, and that is that if you have a fault which can remain active at low angle, when it gets close to the surface, then the geometry of the flexing fault ends up never intersecting the lockup versus depth function under more Coulomb conditions. Okay, and that basically limits the conditions under which rafted blocks might form. So their results would suggest that shallow ship, shallow ship, shallow slip at very low angle should be the norm. But of course, there are problems with this. And they said the reason you get you would expect to get shallow slip is because in the shallow subsurface where sigma one approaches zero, lockup angle becomes very small. But when we approach the surface, of course, we can't do this because we start having Griffiths cracking. So instead of having more Coulomb criteria, we're going to have more Griffiths criteria defined by a parabola uh, where the which intersects the the shear stress axis at the the intact cohesion, which has the, the, uh, a, a value of minus two t, where t is the tensile strength. So what happens if we work in more Griffith space rather than more Coulomb space? The same principle applies there. You have a more circle, which is just an insufficient to cause failure by, by fissuring. So it's just not going to quite reach, sigma three is not going to quite reach T. We can anchor it to that and we can change the size of this more circle and locate what's happening at that point. What we find is that we still allow low angle slip, which approaches zero for non-cohesive faults in the very shallow subsurface. We can work out what the, the value of the angle is by determining this point by solving, by basically equating the more circle to the to the, sl the sliding criterion, develop a quadratic equation and solve our, solving that, and as a result predict lockup angles for more Griffiths conditions. And this is what they look like. We have the intact cohesion shown in black controls the depth scaling. You can see that these two plots are pretty much the same apart from the, the vertical stretch. The fault cohesion determines the, so the fault cohesion ratio, CF over CI, controls basically the lockup angle at the surface, which can go for a cohesionless fault virtually down to zero. Okay. We find that the friction coefficient controls the deep lockup, but even a high friction fault can lock up, can, can slip at very low angles if it has no cohesion, as you can see in this region. And even the lowest angle earthquakes, such as the woodlark earthquakes here and here, and the Corinth earthquakes here and here, are allowed by low cohesion. And shown in green here is the Maui fault, again showing how well that fits with a low cohesion, moderate friction fault. It's allowed basically all the way up to the surface. So the implication is that slip at less than 20 degrees is possible on cohesionless lowish friction faults down to three to eight kilometers. And 0.4 I put that in there because that's the, that's the um, friction coefficient of, of serpentinites. And this is the where S plots on these, these figures, depending on the for low cohesion, moderate friction, or lowish friction faults. 
And finally, the kink in the, the, these lockup curves, the, angle, the lockup angle versus depth, so you see this pronounced kink, that's where we transition from Griffith's behavior, so Coulomb behavior to Griffith's behavior going upwards. Okay, so this is based on Choi and Buck, and this is the new result based on Griffith's, more Griffith's behavior. We can now compare that with what's going on at uh, the Atlantis Massif, which is, I've shown, highlighted there, the surface geometries in the dark red color. But let's uh, go back, go and look at some, why this is important for allowing rider development. So this is what we had from more Coulomb behavior, which we saw never really gets close to our flexing fault. It stays active at very low angles. But if we switch to more Griffiths, we suddenly get this change in behavior and we start to get the fault locking up at a depth in this case of about two kilometers, which is the sort of dimensions we get typically for rafted blocks above low angle normal faults. Let's test this now by looking at the Atlantis Massif, where we have a rafted block and where we have uh, another, another oceanic core complexes where we do not. So shown in green, uh, well, here we've got a couple of cross sections through uh, oceanic core complexes with no rafted blocks, with the geometry detachment uh, constrained by seismic or, or seism seismicity uh, information, or a bit of both in the case of this one to the left. Yeah. Over here, we've got uh, cross sections across the Atlantis Massif taken from Reston and Renero 20 and 11. And these are the dip versus depth uh, profiles of those three detachment systems. So what fault properties predict rafted blocks at the Atlantic Massif, but not at the other oceanic core complexes? So there's the geometry of the Atlantis Massif, just at the where the fault block uh, reaches the surface, or where the, the detachment emerges, I should say. So the, those points there at the sea floor. We can constrain it a bit deeper down from the MEG5 profile, which runs along it, where we can image the detachment at various depths, and we can therefore infer the dip by joining up the surface point with that point to give these dip angles. Those are the open circles here. And then taking it down to depth based on um, the interpret uh, interpreting it in terms of a, um, a fault similar to the to, to, to a, a typically flexing fault, where I just took this from a paper by Brian Tahulke and others in 2008. We can basically estimate where the, the, the lockup angle, sorry, where the, the dip of this fault might be at depth, but where in this case, it has locked. So these are the locking points where the rider block formed. These are the shallower portions where the rider block didn't form. And this is where we want to try and see where we get with our uh, uh, lockup curves. So ideally, what we'd expect is to have a lockup curve, which should basically run from to the left of these points here. It should run to the left of these points here because these didn't lock up. This was slipping until uh, the lockup occurred deeper down. And then it should clip these points here and go through these points because that's where lockup occurred. So just putting some, some lockup curves for different parameters in there, the light blue curve, basically uh, doesn't lock up anywhere. It does say we have, we form no rafted blocks. The light brown curve is gonna be locked up everywhere. So again, we're not gonna form any rafted blocks. The faults are going to have locked and not reach this stage. And the next two curves, with cohesions of initial cohesion of 10, cohesion ratio of 0.16, and friction coefficient of 0.5. That predicts riders, but doesn't quite do the job at the surface. And the best fit has an initial cohesion of 50, a cohesion ratio of 0.16, a, a friction on the fault of 0.85, and then we get beautiful riders developed. And this, anybody who does works in fault mechanics will probably recognize this is basically Biola's law. This is as bog standard fault mechanics as you can possibly get. And this is exactly the fault mechanics you need to predict the formation of rider blocks at the Atlantis Massif. So OCCs appear to have very standard fault properties. So to conclude, the dip distribution of normal fault earthquakes is explained by the rotation of faults to low angle and their lockup under standard fault mechanical properties. The slip of normal faults at low angle is not paradoxical. It only requires low fault cohesion and moderate fault friction. The formation and rafting of rider blocks is favored under Griffith's failure conditions, but again, is consistent with normal rock mechanical properties. And rider blocks on the raft, raft blocks on the, on the Atlantis Massif are rafted blocks. Uh, they occur on the Atlantis Massif, but not on other oceanic core complexes because the Atlantis Massif detachment dips more gently in the subsurface. Although the other faults may also be weaker, there's no need for that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Jim. We have uh, quite a lot of time for question this time because you were so nice and short. I don't always want to be the one asking questions. If someone has a question, you can just type Q in the chat or I, I don't dare to say unmute and ask right away because that might be a big mess. Sasha? Yes. <laughs> too much curious today. So, but I have a general question maybe to, to just address to the, uh, the old community here, especially. I think I, I, I know that you're also quite interested in this low angle, uh, angle uh, faults and their uh, modeling. I was wondering whether there is some uh, deep effect, uh, for example, uh, lithospheric mantle uh, and crustal uh, effects in terms of rheologies, uh, which can control on deviatoric stress, for instance, on the, the evolution of this uh, type of faults and networks. Tim, do you want to take the question? Oh, way, way outside my field. Um, um, <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, I mean, I think you, I'm, I'm arguing that there's nothing special about low angle normal thought. So I'm arguing therefore for no special conditions required. So I, I think you can have anything you want. Okay, thanks. Uh, Suzanne, you had another question? It's just something I was wondering about. Uh, I really like this work, uh, Tim. Um, could you say something about um, the activity of the, um, the faults you talked about, the earthquake time scale? But um, do, do you see any evidence that they're slipping at, at the same time throughout their depth? Or is well, there any? I, I mean, I'm not a seismologist, so I've basically taken other people's results on the seismology. So you, you're really better off asking that question to somebody else. I'm, I'm being a politician today. I'm going to not answer <laughs> any questions that I'm asked. This is my aim in life today is to, to pretend I'm a... a a, a, a typical politician and avoid the question. So I don't know much about the time, the, the time uh, history of this. Uh, the, the, the work which I which we did in terms of the rotation and the locking up um, of faults is that they suggested that they would rotate rapidly. So you'd end up with, with more earthquakes occurring at, at low angles, except there are very far fewer faults remaining at low angles. But that's, that's as far as I've ever got involved in any temporal sequence. Mm -hmm. I guess, I mean, I, I could ask you to, to contrast to, to the, um, the model that we published with John Aliboff uh, some years ago, where we, um, we said we can, you can create these low angle uh, normal faults because they, they are segments that, that lock up and that, that progressively get rotated. So you get these, I mean, yeah, it doesn't no, that was, rough the blocks, right? But, yeah, yeah that, was, oh, that, was, that was a very nice, nice paper, but it's, yes, it was, I was particularly focusing on rafter block formation. Which yeah. I think it, the thing about Lorafti blocks, the formation of Lorafti block tells you exactly when your low angle fault locked up. The geometry of that Lorafti block, block gives you that snapshot of depth and angle at which the fault locked. So if you want to understand the mechanics of low angle faults, I think they're the, the much neglected tool in our toolbox because we can look at that Lorafti block geometry and we can see exactly when the splay fault came up, when the fault locked up. Yeah, no, absolutely. I like this. Thanks, Tim. I'd like to have uh, Gary Kana one question. Uh, sorry, Jan Reto, uh, but I think it's nice if the non uh, conveners ask questions. Oh, sorry, Jan Reto. So, um, just a general question uh, What does it geologically mean to have a fault to the cohesionless? Oh, um. <laughs> Difficult questions in this this seminar series. Good grief! Um, well, it's. I mean, what does it mean to have a fault which has co cohesion? You could ask. A fault, if it is a, a a true break, shouldn't have any cohesion. So, if it's developing cohesion, it must have either not. It may be a, a, a more complicated break. It should. It could be that you've got uh, new mineralization occurred ap across it. So, you know, it's more a question. I think of what 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 controls the cohesion of a fault. I would probably guess, and this is not again. I'm not a rock mechanicist. I would guess uh, cementation. And if, if I was asked to guess, good political answer, Tim. Oh, I love. I like this being a politician business. Well, any work for today. That's it. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Tim.